continue our study in this important and great epistle of 2 Peter. Studies in 2 Peter, the resources of God against the perversions of men. And a lot of perversions of men are going to be discussed, especially in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. And we'll get into that momentarily. Thank you all for being here today, this morning. I've got a little bit of a cold, so I'm not shaking too many hands or trying not to breathe. I am trying to breathe, but I'm not trying to breathe on anybody. So I'm trying to just be nice to you and all of that. Somebody wasn't nice to me and passed it on to me. All right. I think I know who that was, but I'm not naming names. Anyway, um, I, uh, we had a great trip and thank you for allowing us to, to be away and visit grandchildren and friends and just had a great time. And it's uh, great to be refreshed, but you know, after I'm gone for three or four days, I'm ready to come back home. So here we are. We're back home with you and good to see you this morning. So we're looking at 2 Peter, 2 Peter, and we're still in chapter 1. We're at the tail end of that chapter. And we're going to go to God in prayer um, before, we, um, before we begin. <clears throat> Father in heaven, it, it is a joy and a delight to come together as your people and to study your word. And we thank you, Father, for the things that we find to discover and learn from in 2 Peter. And thank you, Father, for the Apostle Peter and for uh, his ministry, for his faith, and so many lessons that we can learn from his life. And we thank you, Father, for the things he's written to us here in this second epistle. Father, we thank you for everyone who, who's here today and uh, for the blessings uh, that come from you that enable enabled all of us to be here today. We thank you for the good health that we enjoy and for the prospects of a great day, this being the day that you have made and this being the Lord's day all in one. And we're thankful, Father, for it and that we have this opportunity to praise and, and glorify your, your great and holy name. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And we pray that, that everything we do and say and think about will be done with him in the background and in the foreground and in every part of what we're about today. Thank you for calling us into your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, we are studying, we'll continue this uh, Wednesday, Lord willing, in, in our study of um, church history. And um, please, um, there are still some handouts out there and we'll continue with that handout that we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, on the coming king and his kingdom. And so be looking forward to Wednesday night. Invite someone to be with us, okay? That would be, that would be a great thing as well. Um, we're in Second Peter um, chapter 1, as I said, and we're kind of at the tail end of this. Just to review, um, Peter is um, he, he's, he's about ready to launch into um, really a, quite a lengthy description of false teachers and he's leading up to that, but before he gets that, gets there, he wants to assure his readers of some things that they already know. He's already told them in chapter one that I'm really writing you, writing to you to remind you of things that you already know. And he says that a number of times. Uh, I want you to remember the things that you already know. And it's my job, <clears throat> he says, before I leave this world, um, to, to remind you, to put you in remembrance of the things you already know. Um, and he reminds them in verse 15, he says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. And then he goes on, verses 16 through the end of, uh, of this chapter, he makes, draws a, a pretty stark contrast between um, the message of his ministry and the other apostles and prophets and Christians and the gospel, the truth, the message of God that they preached and they presented to them and that they're presenting all over the world and the message, the cunning messages, the messages of falsehood of the false teachers. So first of all, he's laying this foundation, again, of things they already know, but this foundation that the message that he presented to them uh, is grounded uh, in not only his experience as an apostle, his experience with Jesus, and also 
uh, the message of the prophets who came before him. Look at what he says in verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Okay, he's going to talk in a few, uh, in a little bit, a few verses about some of those cunningly devised fables, okay? But we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then it's almost verse 17. I would have said it a little bit differently than he did, but he's writing under inspiration, okay? I would have said, let me give you an example, okay? Because that's what he's going to do. Let me give you an example of the experience and the eyewitness of something that, that I experienced when I was with Jesus. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we remember what he's referring to here in verse 18, he says, and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So he's referring here to the incident that occurred in Acts chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 17, that was orchestrated by God when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into the mountain, okay? And Peter, interestingly, refers to it as the holy mountain. We don't really know what mountain this was, um, but I think he refers to it as the holy mountain because of this very experience, okay? Wasn't anything holy about it until God decided to, to, to set this mountain apart and use it for this purpose. And so uh, he, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into this mountain. Jesus was transfigured in front of them, before them. Remember, there were two other um, personalities on the scene. Who were they? Moses and Elijah. Yeah, Moses and Elijah, okay? And they were conversing with Jesus. And Peter, James, and John saw all of this. They witnessed all of this. And they saw Jesus in all of his, in all of his brilliance and, and glory. They were seeing Jesus in a way that they'd never seen him before. Okay? So this was quite a sight to behold. But very important, very important, um, there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In Matthew chapter 17, there is the addition of this, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, okay, hear him. Which, you know, Peter just didn't record that particular part. But, but Peter was there on that occasion and he heard um, that voice from heaven. And it reminds us, it reminds us what, what the, the Lord said um, to Jesus, what God said to Jesus reminds us of what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, I believe verse 18, if I'm not mistaken, um, that the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like unto me, um, and when he comes, you hear him, listen to him, okay? I, I like that because Moses was getting the children of Israel ready. He knew that they would be studying the scriptures long after he was gone, and he was getting the children of Israel ready for a time in the future when God would send his special messenger, the Messiah, the Christ, his own son, and he would come with a message. And Moses was saying, you need to get ready for that. When he comes, he's going to be similar to me, um, and you need to listen to him. Okay? And um, Peter and James and John, they were there on that holy mountain, and they heard all of that. I like verse 19, which is where, really where we're beginning here um, this morning. And it reminds me of our study on Wednesday night, okay? Because we're looking at what the prophet said about the coming king and his kingdom and what the prophets foretold. And I'm thinking of Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah and all the prophets of the Old Testament. And we have, you know, their writings here in the Old Testament. I think of what they said, and Peter was familiar with it. Um, how familiar his readers are, we, 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 we don't know, but probably they were somewhat familiar, maybe because Peter had told them previously. But they seem to have been somewhat familiar with what th this, this, this point of reference that Peter is giving them, because he refers to the prophets and he f refers to what they wrote. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. And you and me today, we can go back and we can look at the prophets and what they said and, 
And we can say, yes, that's, that's what they said. And, and yes, it came to pass. It came to pass in the ministry of Christ and in the coming of the kingdom because the prophets had a lot to say about the kingdom of God coming. And so he says, and, and, and keep in mind that he is referring here to his eyewitness account and to the word of the prophets and how these two conform and, and how they match up perfectly, okay? So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Um, interesting language that he uses, it's uh, poetic. Um, it is uh, somewhat figurative um, to what is coming in the future. Um, the prophetic word, of course, the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ and the events of the transfiguration that, that Peter and the others witnessed. By heeding, what does it mean to heed something? This is a, a, an important New Testament word, heed. What does it mean to heed What's that? Okay, yeah, it means to, to obey. It means to pay attention to it, um, to, to fix the mind and the heart on what it is that, that, that's being said, the message that is given. And so by heeding, by fixing their minds and taking it seriously and doing what it says, um, the point really of verse 19 is that they would do well spiritually. Now, remember that Peter has already been talking about their, them doing well spiritually and growing and being mature in Christ in verses 5 through um, verse 11, if you remember, when he talks about uh, being diligent to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and, and so on. And we looked at, at those things that our faith is, is supposed to have, components, the components of, of our faith. So we need to heed the word of God, whether it's from the prophets, whether it's from the apostle Peter even, okay? Because Peter is speaking prophetically. We need to heed the word of God concerning um, the teaching. Uh, it's teaching about uh, the identity of Jesus Christ. We're gonna go on in chapter two, and Peter is going to tell us about one of the traits of false teachers. And that is, um, they will deny, they will even deny the Lord who bought them. Okay? So Peter, I mean, look at the contrast of that. False teachers are going to come and they're going to deny the Lord who, who gave his life to save them. They're going to say, oh, that's nothing, that's not important. We don't know who Jesus is, we don't need Jesus. You know, they would deny the Lord who bought them. But Peter says, look, we were eyewitnesses of Jesus. We believe that he is who he claimed to be, and we believe what the prophet said about him. Okay, so he's clearly putting this before his readers, he's putting it before us. You need to make up your mind, you need to decide what you're gonna believe. You're gonna believe Jesus and the prophets? Uh, you're gonna believe our eyewitness account? Or are you going to um, believe uh, the false teachers who deny the Lord? So anyway, we need to fix our minds on, on the prophetic word and obey it. We need to heed it. The prophecies, this prophetic word is like, is like a light. The New Testament writers Paul the Apostle, John, of course, the, the, the Gospel of John does this in a major way. It has this great contrast between dark, darkness and light. Okay? And that's something we can all relate to. Uh, darkness is good when you want to go to sleep and all that stuff, but we need light to live and to work and to, to survive and to do all the things that we need to do. Light is so important. In, in the scriptures, and I think of 1 John chapter one, for example, in the scriptures, darkness is a synonym of falsehood, of error, um, of, of ungodliness and unrighteousness, but the opposite of truth. Light is a synonym, figure, a figurative uh, synonym of truth. 
and enlightenment and progress and maturity, okay? Goodness and righteousness and godliness. So look at what he says, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. We need to pay attention to the prophetic word. We need to pay attention to the word of God, okay? Because it will for us, um, if we heed it, if we pay attention to it, it will be like a light that shines in a dark place, okay? If you're in a, a place of darkness and you need to move about, the first thing you do is turn on a light. Get your light, okay? Uh, light is important. Isn't it important? Isn't it interesting that who would have ever thought to do this, but Apple thought to do this to put a flashlight on your, on your smartphone, okay? It was perfect. It's, it's a great idea, okay? And, uh, you know, because that's one of the most important things that we need in life is light to be able to see the way. And so we have a flashlight, we have a smartphone with a, with a flashlight on it, and um, that light shines in a dark place um, until the day dawns. Notice the idea of the day dawning and the morning star rises in your heart. It's not exactly clear what he is referring to, but basically uh, two possibilities, and, and neither one are in conflict with the other. Um, it's either referring to the second coming of Christ, okay? If you pay attention to the word of God, it will lead you, it will guide you, it will help you to see clearly until the second coming of Christ, or, um, another possibility is Christian maturity, which he has already been talking about in, in chapter one here. Christian maturity, perhaps because he talks about it rising in your heart. Okay. Anyway, anyway, who is not attracted to this description? Okay, we're we're attracted to this. This is this this draws us in. Who doesn't want light? Who doesn't want to to be able to see clearly? And and the word of God enables us to see what is true about Jesus. And it helps us to see what is true um, in our hearts. And it helps us to see what is true in, in the world around us. And that is worth more than gold, okay? To be able to see. Well, um, the word of God, especially, uh, now especially confirmed, when heated, it gives us light. It gives us enlightenment um, towards the beginning of something amazing and, and new and fresh and, and beautiful. Uh, light is beautiful. Light is beautiful, okay? It, it's surely that we can make this connection. When God is described in heaven in the book of Revelation, and especially at the end of the book of Revelation where John is obviously wrapping things up and he's telling us about heaven and what heaven is going to be like. Well, what does he say to us about God? And, and when we see God and we're with God, what's that going to be like? What does he say, remember? That God is light. God is our light. We're not going to need the sun when we get to heaven because God is our light. The idea, when, when we think of God, one of the first things we think of is that word glory, and the word glory means brilliance, brightness, light, okay? So light is something that's actually beautiful and attractive. We're attracted to, to the light. So verses 20 and 21, and this, these are important words uh, coming off verses 18 and 19 and everything else that he said here. Um, this is important for the setup for where he's taking us in 2 Peter, okay? Knowing this first, okay? This is foundational. This is fundamental. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. At the time Peter wrote this, uh, all of the New Testament books were not yet written, but they were on the way uh, to being written. That's one of the things we'll, we will touch on when we look at the subject of church history on Wednesday nights. But, but um, um, the prophecies of the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, <clears throat> those 
those were complete and those were available just as they are available uh, today. So this is foundational. This is, this is bedrock. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So this is the first thing you need to know. Keep in mind, and th- this, is, this is an important contrast, verse 16. We did not follow cunningly devised fables. Now, cunningly devised fables are not... Uh, they're, they're, fab- well, what's a fable? Mm, uh, a story kind of usually has like, a, like some principle, some lesson, usually... Um, that's being taught, but basically a a story, okay? Um, And stories are great. I mean, stories are great. Who doesn't love to hear a good story? Jesus told stories. Um, uh, Many of the great preachers and and teachers, uh, secular, religious, tell stories because stories make, make an impact and they draw you in and they help you use the imagination and and especially when those stories teach lessons. Jesus used stories in a masterful way, of course. Well, guess what? False teachers use stories too. And they invent stories, okay, um, that they use to, you know, to teach their lessons and put out their ideas. And, and, and it captures the mind, captures the heart. Well, in verse 16, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Well, what did we follow? Well, there, there was, you know, we followed Jesus and we saw him and we also followed the prophetic word. We heeded that. We, we paid attention to that. Okay. And, and I, Peter's saying, I recommend that you pay attention to that as well. Okay. Because these, the, the, the prophecy of scripture that you read about, the prophecy of scripture, okay, um, is not of any private interpretation, okay? No prophecy of Scripture, okay? You want to talk about Daniel? You want to talk about Joshua? You want to talk about Isaiah? Uh, None of those, none of those is of any private interpretation, okay? The meaning of interpretation, and some, maybe there are different translations that mean that kind of uh, translated in different ways. I, I'm, I don't, I'm using the New King James Version. I don't really prefer um, that rendering of it um, because really it's talking about origin, where it came from. Um, no prophecy of Scripture uh, is of any human origin. It's, of, it's not of, uh, of a human uh, resource. Um, and included with that, is the idea of explanation. When, when God gave his message to the prophets, and it came from God, and that's, you have to recognize that. It came from God. And then he, he, he used the, 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 the prophets as tools to deliver the message, okay? So, so it came from God, and, and it, came from the, it came through the prophet, and then the, the prophets would, would explain it, um, they would help people to understand it, okay? Jesus did that, okay? Moses did that, the prophets did that. And um, sometimes we need that. You, you may, may remember Ezra and how Ezra, when, he, when the law was discovered and the law, or not just discovered, but he, when he went to Jerusalem, when he went back to Jerusalem, he preached the word of God. And it says that he gave the sense he gave the sense, the kind of an explanation of it, helping people to understand it, to grasp it. And that's what prophets and teachers and preachers and elders and Bible class teachers and, and friends and neighbors and moms and dads, that's what they do. They give the word of God and then they help to explain it and understand it and, and, and make, make application. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. 
Yeah. And Jesus, Jesus did that. I mean, Jesus, Jesus took Daniel, for example, in Matthew chapter 24, and, and he took what Jan, Daniel said, and he said, you know, what I'm really talking about is what, what Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. Yeah, Hora? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good, very good. I like I like the way you're saying that, and and that is, and I'll try to repeat that because um, it's not of any private interpretation. When we deliver the word of God, we need to deliver it in the way that God, the way that God delivered it. And in and and give the meaning of it that God that God put in it, okay. And that's very very important. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, no one's really going to be judged by their interpretations of, of Scripture. I've heard that statement or something similar to that many times. It's just not true. It's not true at all. Uh, when you're coming to the Scriptures, you need to interpret it, understand it, um, the the way it was written. Um, you get off that and you suggest that God's word means something else um, than what God intended, then you're, you're treading on some pretty dangerous ground. Um, the Bible was never given to us, and this is important for all the world to know and for us to know, the Bible was not given to us just to do with it whatever we want, okay? Uh, you can find all kinds of things in Scripture. You can find little phrases and, and that kind of thing, and you can make application of those little phrases and words uh, in, in, to multiple things. Um, but be very careful about that because you don't want to misuse the Scriptures and, and apply the Scriptures in, in ways that God didn't intend. So very good comment. All of you are making good comments. I appreciate that. Um, for the prophecy never came by the will of man. So here he's talking about where it came from. For the prophecy, the word of God never came by the will of man. Not like those cunningly devised fables, verse 16. Not like them. Okay. The word of God, prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. A couple of things here. Look at that word spoke. Verse 21, uh, the, the prophets, and, and he talks about uh, the, the prophecy of Scripture in verse 20. Yeah, prophecy was meant to be written, okay? Um, and it was written, and God inspired it so that it would be written properly, okay? But prophecy was also spoken, and it was meant to be spoken. The Word of God, when we hear preaching or we hear the teaching of God's Word, you know, it, it, it's not just for reading. It is for speaking, okay? Whether you're reading the Scripture word for word or you're reading it and then you're talking about it and its application and its meaning and all of that. Speaking, very, very important. And we need to make sure we're speaking correctly and in agreement in harmony with, with God's word. Very, very important that we do this and, and that we not follow cunningly devised fables, made up stories, or not just stories, but words that, that do not derive from, from the scriptures. This idea of speaking is very important. Um, I want you to look at, to just make a comparison if you've got your Bibles open there and you can see, and, and you can see what's, what's happening here. Look at how he says in verse 16, he talks about fables. In verse 17, he refers to vo the voice. The voice, there's, there's the idea of speaking. Verse 18, he again refers to the voice, the voice of God that came from heaven. Verse 19, he refers to the prophetic word. Okay, You know, it, it, it's, it's okay to refer to the scriptures as writing, yeah, we, we refer to it as the holy writ, the, the writing of God, okay? But the word of God um, is a little broader, and it refers to writing and also speaking, okay? Writing and speaking. So you have this, this continual um, Peter saying it again and again, the word of God, 
the voice of God. Um, and, and here again, in verse 20, prophecy, and then in verse 21, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's where their message came from. It came from the Holy Spirit. He inspired them. Uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 as well. And, and uh, of course, you're very familiar with 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, so the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is one of those great statements in the New Testament that uh, reminds us that um, where the scriptures came from, where the prophecy of God's word came from. Um, if you look at Acts chapter 27, I think this is a, just a neat little comparison to make. Acts chapter 27 and uh, verse, um, let me see, verse 15. Acts 27 verse 15. So when the ship, and it's talking about a, a real ship out, out in the Mediterranean Sea. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And then drop down to verse 17. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship because the ship was coming apart and feared lest they should run aground on the Sirtis Sands they struck sail and so were driven. Okay, the idea of driven there, the reason why I wanted you to notice that is because the same word that Luke uses is the same word that Peter is using here, moved by the Holy Spirit, driven by the Holy Spirit. He could say it that way if he wanted to, okay? Or it could be translated that way anyway. But holy men of God spoke as they were pushed along as they were driven, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting, just an interesting comparison there. Okay, just like a, a ship on the ocean and has the sails and the wind pushes that ship along. So holy men of God were pushed along by the Holy Spirit to write the things that they wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great point. Very, 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 very good point. And we think of, of, of people that we have known who have passed on and, and how their memory and, and the things that they stood for and the things that they did, and especially if they're godly, righteous people, they're still speaking. They're still speaking. The, the voices are still echoing and still uh, affecting us and influencing our lives. Yeah, Bill. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. I'm glad you raised this point because it, this needs to be raised. I've said it, I, I'll continue to say it. The written word of God is written for a reason. We don't have Jesus here sitting here and, and teaching us and of course if he was here we would we would we would let him say anything that he wanted to say you know but we don't have the voice of, of Jesus audibly uh, in in this building right now well what what do we have we have the words of Jesus that have been recorded for us and those words are intended by God to have the very same effect on us that it did on those who actually heard him audibly, okay? And, and Peter, I think, is, is pointing this out. I think you can take it from what Peter is saying. You know, you weren't there 
He's talking to his readers. You know, you weren't there with us in the holy mountain. You weren't there. You didn't hear the voice that came from heaven. We heard it. And, and, and God wants us to tell you about it. For what purpose? So that they too will believe. So that they too will, will make up their minds to follow, follow Jesus. This is the very point that the apostle John is making in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says, you know, we handled the word of life. We touched him. We, we heard him. We were there with him in the flesh. And he, he's writing to, to, to those in Ephesus. And he's saying, you know, you weren't there, but you've signed on to the same thing that, that, that we believe. Even though we were eyewitnesses, you were not eyewitnesses, but, but you've decided that you're going to believe what, what we shared with you and what we told you. And today, that's why none of us in this room have ever spent time with Jesus in the flesh. But we believe, we believe. Remember that great encounter between Jesus and the apostles and Thomas after Jesus' resurrection, you remember, you remember. And, and Thomas was not going to believe. He told his brother apostles, he said, I'm not going to believe unless I see him, unless I touch his side, unless I put my, my fingers uh, on, on the nail prints. You know, I need that, um, uh, uh, Thomas said. Jesus made his appearance to Thomas. And uh, what did Jesus say to Thomas? You're blessed. You're blessed, Thomas, because you get, you get to handle. And, and he told him, he's, yeah, okay, Thomas, come up here. Put, put, put your hand in my side, okay? Now, now, now that, that, that's a great thing. And, and Thomas replied, my Lord and my God, okay? So he, he believed what he was touching and seeing. Okay, he believed that. But then what did Jesus tell Thomas? And it's written for us. He said, blessed are those who believe, who have not seen, and who have not touched. Okay, he's talking to us. He's talking about you and me who believe in Jesus as a result of this. So, with this background, with this background of, of chapter one, very, very important uh, stuff that we're looking at here. Uh, the holy men of God, they were true prophets. They were used by God. Uh, Peter counts himself and his brother apostles in that number. He uses the word we uh, here. Um, and then in contrast to that, there is the will of man. Um, and he's referring here to false prophets um, and to their fables, uh, to the things that they say, cunningly devised fables. Okay, in other words, they were, they were put together. They were, uh, these stories, these principles, these, these messages, they were put together for the purpose of deception, for teaching error. Yeah, Debbie, please. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it was a big thing. We'll talk about that in church history. I hate to put that off, but we'll talk about that in our discussion of church history of Gnosticism and its impact on the on the early church. Anyway, uh, but, and and like you said, Debbie, it's still around uh, around today. Okay, Gnosticism. Be careful. With that, any bill? You got your sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Very good, very good. Thank you for that reminder of Thomas and tracing the things that, that he believed and, and did and things very, very good. You know, I just want to just to remind us and, and what we what I, I talked about I think two weeks ago when last time we were here. And then we'll quit because our time is about up. But remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into the mountain. Remember that. He didn't take all of them. He could have, Jesus could have taken all the disciples up into the mountain. But he only took those three. And I think the reason why he did that, and he did that on a number of occasions, he would only take three. He took three into the garden, into the deeper part of the garden. He didn't take all the disciples. Why? I think because it's my, my, my belief, my opinion, is that I think that he was teaching all the disciples the, the, the bedrock principle of I'm going to let some people have an eyewitness encounter and the other group, they have to believe the message of those who were eyewitnesses, okay? Which is the process that is at work today. Why do we believe what Peter and and James and John and all of them, why do we have to believe that? Well, he wants us to exercise our faith and to trust the evidence that is in front of us. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point. That's a very good point. And one of those what we call Christian virtues that he mentions there is knowledge. Okay, knowledge. Um, very, very good, very good, very good comment. Very, very good. These are just foundational things. Maybe we're thinking about them in a different way, but foundational things that we really need to hold on to. And when we go into chapter two next week, Lord willing, um, you're going to, you know, the question that his readers need to ask, well, were these, were these people that are coming to us with these strange new doctrines and everything, were they, uh, did they, were they eyewitnesses, you know? And, and they're, they're coming up with, with new things and things that we've not heard before and they, didn't, they don't agree with the things that Peter said and the other apostles said. So, you know, maybe we ought to reject them because they're not inspired. So... Okay, thank you all very much for being a part of our class and Lord willing, next week uh, we'll go into chapter two, I hope.